say it's always a bad sign when the lights go down and I'm still down there. Um, welcome to the Star Theater and to our last full C day. I know that's that's kind of kind of sad. I, I I really really enjoy C days. I know I say that every C day because uh, it's it's a day of endless possibilities. There are different parts of the ship. Uh, how many have done um, the steam bath and then the ice? Okay, for all those who have not, it is one of the coolest hidden gems of Viking where uh, some Nor Norwegian, they have these things called blue zones, uh, and I know this is really off task, but it's really cool. Uh, they have these things called blue zones around the world where people statistically live longer than everyone else. Uh, and, and one of them, they have tried to classify why it works in various blue zones. And, and one of the things that sociologists have, have looked at is this hot cold thing. And it's supposed to enhance your immune system, help you live longer. So you go down to the spa, you sit in the hot um, steam room till you can't sit in the hot steam room anymore. And then you run across into the ice room and then sit into the ice room until you can't anymore. And then you go back. Uh, and it, it's actually actually kind of kind of fun so if you haven't done it take a, a minute to go play in the spa uh, and a sea day is a great day to do that uh, all right so I'm Dr. Brian Babcock as many of you know I'm your resident historian and I get to talk about the spa now I get to talk about the history of na navigation today uh, and, and again this is one of those semester long courses where we're going to kind of blow through at a high level uh, and look first at kind of how cultures have built upon one another around the world uh, to bring us to where we are today, and then how technology has built uh, along. And I thought a great place to, to um, start is with Van Schagen's map from 1689. Uh, and, and what I love about it, kind of like the Bayou Tapestry, is that in the middle you, you have our map, but around it you have these wonderful scenes scenes as well. Uh, and so to kind of look at the scenes is up on the upper left, we have this battle scene. Uh, why they include that with the map, I don't know. But uh, maybe Adrian, our art historian, can tell us. But uh, it has, has a battle scene on the upper left. On the upper right, it looks kind of like a heaven scene. We have these angels, uh, but we also have some mythological creatures. So most likely that is Olympus. And then on the lower part, we have Cerberus, which again kind of supports our Olympus. It's off the screen. Uh, but we have this underworld. Old Cer Cerberus kind of thing, and then we have ships and mermaids on the lower right. Uh, so we have a globe, and, and at first glance, when you sat down and you looked at it, you saw a globe. But we we need. I love art history, and I love trying to appreciate why an artist does what they do. And even though this is meant to be a hard map, uh, it brings us in uh, and has a whole lot more going on. Now, as a map, Map, how many would say this looks pretty much like the world? A few. If you start to look at it, though, um, it, at this point, they still, if I can make this work, down here, we do not have um, Antarctica. It's still missing. Uh, if you look in the upper left, if I can again, well, in the upper left, you'll notice we don't have Canada. Uh, that parts of Canada as late as the late 1600s still have not been fully charted. Uh, and so even in 1690s, we're still missing large chunks of the world on a world map. Uh, and so navigation and understanding what the world looked like is clearly a process. But before we jump in... Um, Something that I do that's a little different. Uh, as you might guess, I, I love history, and I also love a good treasure hunt. Uh, and so each cruise on one stop, I create the Viking Resident Historian Challenge. 
So tomorrow is your Viking resident historian challenge. If you take out your phone and take a picture of this, then you can participate. Um, what this is, tomorrow on most of our stops, you're going to stop at a place called the Little White House, La Petite Maison Blanc. Uh, it's this little white house that is unique to Sag Saguenay, and it is unique because in the lower right hand, you see this major flood that came through the area, and this little house was the only thing in the flood's path that survived. So it is seen as, as not only a, a cute icon, uh, but it is is emblematic um, of perseverance and tenacity and the ability to stand in the face of the flood. So for the Viking Resident Historian Challenge, your challenge is to take the first person or group that takes a selfie with this in the background, this house in the background, wins the selfie challenge. The next prize, which, by the way, prizes are absolutely nothing. Um, but uh, the, the second award goes to the person or group that takes the most creative photo with La Petite Maison Blanc in the background. So two awards. First award is the first. The second award is the most creative. And, and, and when I say you win nothing, that's not entirely true. I have a world-renowned blog. And, and by world-renowned, I mean that there are at least 13 or 14 people who follow it. So, so I, I take these photos, and then I give the story of the history behind it, and I, and I put these in as kind of a, a, a fun side note, uh, and my 13, well, I mean, if we count family, I, I think there's four. There might be four people who follow me that aren't family uh, on this blog, but um, you can email me a photo, you can WhatsApp signal or text me a photo, and uh, then if you ever want to be the 15th person to actually follow my blog, uh, it's renaissancelife.world. Um, so I'll post kind of a history and pictures with that there. So our Viking Resident Historian Challenge is tomorrow, and I will announce the winner at my Meaning of Life. See, it kind of ties together. Uh, at the Meaning of Life forum that I'll do tomorrow night. Um, okay, so on to navigation. I want to really kind of walk through this chart, uh, which starts with the Austronesians, uh, moves through the Minoans and the Greeks and the Chinese and the Arabs and the Vikings, and then the age of exploration all the way to the modern age. So as you can see, we're talking about several, well, a couple thousand years at least um, of history of navigation uh, and kind of how it flowed from cultures. But then I also want to take a few minutes and look at various pieces uh, and tools that have allowed for navigation, uh, from the compass to the astrolabe uh, to this search for longitude. And I will use two terms, sometimes incorrectly, uh, so just stay with me. Uh, two ter terms are latitude, and latitude is your relative position to the equator, so north and south of the equator. That's latitude. Longitude is where do we sit on the map um, east and west. Uh, and one of those is much easier to determine than the other, and we're going to talk about that. And the reason I say it is latitude and longitude, in my mind, can reverse. So just remember the definition that latitude is north-south, longitude east-west. So if I mix it up, you can at least correct it in your minds. So in 1714, we start to look for longitude, uh, looking at sea clocks and why those are so important, sextants, uh, nautical al almanacs, how we then come to a line of position, standard time, prime meridian, and ultimately to the modern GPS. So as you can see, a tremendous amount of ground to cover in now 42 minutes. Uh, and so so we're going to look at early navigation instruments, age of exploration, and the electronic era. Uh, this is a, a redo of a map that I've already shown. And if we go back to what I would consider to be some of the 
earliest sea navigation. It really is those people groups that are at least following the Taiwanese model are coming out of Asia and using these open canoes, uh, outrigger type type can canoes, and traveling from Taiwan out to um, Micronesia, Melanesia, and ultimately Polynesia. And if you look at my map starting 35 100 BP is before present. Uh, so that's, that, that is a, a different way than AD and BC. But to look at 3,500 years ago, we see the Taiwanese model showing that people are beginning to migrate, and they're not just migrating by land, they're beginning to migrate by sea as well. And so using this out of Thai Taiwanese model, it was initially simulations uh, and theory, and then recently, as we begin to do more genetic research and understand genetic research, uh, they're actually confirming this model. And the outer reaches of that model were saying that they went as far as Easter Island, uh, but now genetic research is confirming that not only did they go to Eastern I Island, but they actually were able to make it to the western coast of South America. So this migration migration by open canoe uh, is actually going all the way across the Pacific, which is amazing to think roughly 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and 2,000 years ago, people are coming across successfully and trading and colonizing that far away against that much open ocean. So if we look at the Polynesians, how did they do it? Uh, and, and first, they did have an understanding of stars. So they were able to do navigation at night in open waters by following following various stars. They also would use frigates. And, and if you haven't seen a frigate, they're, they're still pretty popular and common down in the Caribbean. But frigates look like the old pterodactyl. They have those kind of crooked wings, and they go up really high. And frigates are one of the few birds that will not sit on water. So while they will hunt and fish from high in the sky, they're, they're not like uh, a pelican that would, would actually sit and float. So they would keep them on their boats because if you release one, either it is going to go find land and land, or it is not going to see land and it's going to come back to you as the only non-water source. So they're much better than, than taking other seabirds that could actually fly a mile or two and then just sit on top of the ocean. So they used birds, these frigates, to be able to determine if land was close by. They also had a unique understanding of wind, waves, and currents. Uh, and one of the things I, I really love about the Polynesians, and this is still in effect today. If you go and visit uh, Tahiti or Bora Bora or any of these Polynesian islands, you can go into a gift shop and see what we have in that lower right hand. Well, that's not what I want. Uh, let's go back there and try this again. There we go. So if we go down here, you, you, you can see Man, that does not want to work today. Um, we'll go that way. All right, so um, you can see that, that, that twig chart in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, and, and what that twig chart is is not just a map. It is a map, but it, it's a map of sea currents. And it's a map, well, there we go. I've got all kind of little things happening. I'm going to put that there. Uh, all right, so it has all kinds of sea currents. <laughs> you know, when you're up here, you just have to go with things. Uh, but it, it has these sea currents. It has wave patterns. And what they would do is they would do this and then study it and use it as a learning device, not as a map that they had in their, their, their boat, that they would memorize it. But from these little twigs, they could actually determine how far it was and where they were relative to other islands. And then they, they would weave
weave in a shell to post where little islands were. It's really amazing, and it's something, this one is from 1904. You can find examples of it today, but, but for well over 1,500 years, they understood that waves were different depending upon where you were in the area and how to use that and how to use these currents to find other islands. And then we go to, to the Phoenicians. And, and Phoenicians are very close to, to my heart because they're, they're active in my area of research uh, in both Egypt and then Israel and Bab Bab Babylon at that time. But the Phoenicians were some of the first sea traders and sea explorers in the Mediterranean. And they understood, similar to what, what was happening in the Pacific, they understood how to use landmarks. They're some of the first to use the North Star for navigation and understanding its position. Uh, they, they tended to put in at night so that they would sail during the day. They didn't necessarily like to sail overnight. And so they would, every about a day's sailing distance, they would put in, they would form a trading post, make a little Phoenician outpost, and then continue to day hop one day's journey at a time. And that's not always the case, but that is an, a, a generalization about the Phoenicians. Uh, they colonized and they traded and they brought ideas from all over the Mediterranean. And that's one of the things that navigation does for us, is navigation allows one people group to take their ideas and their items and establish trade far away, but not just bring back silver from Spain, but also to bring back different worldviews from Spain back to the Levant. Uh, they, they were so active that they actually founded one really large trading post in North Africa called Carthage which was a Phoenician trading post, but it becomes, and it even rivals Rome as an ancient civ civilization. But so some of the things that, that they bring out are from Tyre, which is a Phoenician cities, a city. Not only do they create what is the beginnings of a modern alphabet, uh, but they also bring trees that are traded throughout the Mediterranean. And then Byblos, uh, another Phoenician city, uh, is become synonymous with books because they're binding uh, new ideas, these, these new written doc documents down. And so a Biblos or a Bible becomes a synonym for a book, and that's where we get the name Bible. But they also understood trade in such that a monopoly is better than not a monopoly. Because if you have a monopoly on an item, you can charge whatever you want. And so they found that through their trade, if they could control as much as 100% of an item, that was better. And they found that there's this little mollusk that they could, in fact, create a purple dye out of it. And they created a monopoly on this royal purple dye. And so in Rome, all of a sudden, you know, wearing purple, man, I am really cool. I actually wore my pur purple tie for that reason. Uh, but, but, it, that, but they were the only people that had this purple. So if you're a Roman and you want to have beautiful purple clothing, you have to get it from the Phoenicians. So they're weaving in this idea of navigation as a new way to do trade, and within that trade, creating a model where you can now not only trade, but have monopolies as well. Um, so the Phoenicians were large at really monetizing the Mediterranean. Well, the Greeks then begin to navigate and follow the, the, the Phoenicians, but they say the Phoenicians understand the Mediterranean. We want to branch out further. And, and the Greeks are really the first ones to take what they've done and write it down. So when we look at an, an advancement here on the left, uh, they actually begin to say, we're going to publish loose term, uh, we're going to write things down and share information. But they're also the first civilization, at least coming out of the West, to say that we have gone so far north 
that we have found a land where the sun never sets. So they're the first to record this idea that, that, that you go further north, the sunlight lasts longer in the summer, and we have the land of the midnight sun. They're also the first to record that we were out going, and there's actually ice on water, because in the Mediterranean, it doesn't freeze in the winter. So they go north, and they see this pancake ice, so much so that Pliny says, uh, one day sail from Thule, which is thought to be the orc the islands uh, is the frozen ocean uh, called by some the Cornean Sea. So they, they come out and they branch beyond and they have that questioning spirit of really what's out there? What, what's next? What don't we know? And that is a hallmark of the Greeks is trying to understand uh, what else is happening. And the, the, at the same time, we have Carthage. And Carthage is beginning to ask similar questions, but while the Greeks go north, the Carthaginians go west, uh, and, and they then uh, go west and then south along the west coast of Africa. And they, they, they begin to look at what they can trade and find, and they go down to Gabon, on this one journey that is recorded by Hanno, uh, which is not Hannibal, but is a guy named Hanno, and, and he goes to Gabon and he finds these strange looking people. Uh, and he thinks they're really odd. He wants to capture them and bring them back. He can't capture any men, but he does capture two women. And he brings them back in the boat. And he tries to communicate with them. They just don't want to communicate. Uh, he tries to, 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 to find a way to coexist. And these women are so violent that on the way back, he feels that he is forced to kill them and throw them overboard. So he never makes it back with them. He kills these two women, but he records in his diary uh, that he's done it uh, in his journals, and in his journals, uh, he calls them gorillas. Now, the question is, did he find gorillas, confuse them for humans, and was trying to bring them back, or is he just calling these women gorillas and we don't know the answer? But it's interesting that he did it. Some, something else that then Hannibal does is in these same types of trading journeys, Hannibal comes down and what does Hannibal bring back? Elephants. He brings back the war elephants. Elephant, something that, that he feels now that his father has failed in the first Punic War against Rome, he is going to lead a second Punic War against Rome. He finds these war elephants that are seemingly impregnable, uh, kind of like the modern-day tank, uh, and he brings them back. He starts the second Punic War, uh, and Hannibal then, using nav nav navigation support, goes into Spain, comes around, invades Italy and has the Second Punic War where mostly he defeats the Romans until the Romans come back and attack Carthage. Long story for a different day. But, but navigation is used for trade by these folks and to expand a knowledge of the world. Then we move to the Romans. And um, I love the Romans. The Romans are, are a great group who really do absolutely nothing. Um, and, and some of you might argue with me on that, but, but the Romans to me are the best engineers in the world. They take someone else's idea and then show how you can do it in a big way. So, uh, you know, we think of the Romans as giving us the aqueduct, Romans didn't give us the aqueduct. Uh, that's actually Persian, uh, and, and yet the Romans are able to make them farther, better, and more lasting than anyone else. So, so they take a Persian idea. The Roman road we give to the Romans Persian. Uh, the Persian road uh, really is, is what the Romans then modeled their road after. They just do it better than everyone else. And they document everything that they do. So the Romans, as far as navigation, they take the best and the brightest ideas from every other culture, and then they give it to the world. 
So as the Romans conquer the world, uh, they bring lighthouses, they bring roads, they bring this Baltic cog that, that, that they use and modify for their pur- purposes. Uh, they bring all of the navigation from the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians, uh, and they bring it to bear, but they do it in a grand scale. So the Romans really take technology and bring it to a new level uh, as they go. So we have the Romans, and then uh, we move to other types of equipment. Uh, if, if we look at, at equipment, some of the first that comes out is really this idea of a compass, and a compass is taking a lodestone that, that they found actually had the properties to determine direction. It stayed constant. And initially, the Chinese used this not in navigation, but actually in fortune telling. So that you can use a lodestone to help you determine direction and then baffle your friends during a fortune telling. But, but quickly, during the Han di- dynasty, they find that it can be used consistently to tell us direction. And then as we move both western and eastern, uh, you're able to use a compass for direction using a card and a needle. Um, which brings us to the East. I, most of our lectures are very Western-centric. We tend to uh, look at things and say, well, Europe was the very first. Rome was the very first to do these things. Vikings were the very first to do things. And yet, for the most part, the East is far ahead of Europe. Even though we tend to spend most of our time there, if if we were to spend more time looking at China, we would find that at least decades, if not hundreds of years above the West, we have China doing things in a more superior way. And one of them is this guy, Zheng He. And and I've I've been told that, that the best way to say it is actually Chang even though it's spelled the way you see it up there on the left. So I'm going to call him Chang Ho, and Chang Ho has an interesting story. Uh, If you think about China, and you look at China in that 15th uh, century, uh, Chang Ho is a Muslim, and he is a Muslim living in the sphere of China, and he's actually captured by the Ming Dynasty, uh, and he is castrated, which is kind of a rough, rough thing for a guy to go through. Uh, but he 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 hangs with it, and he becomes re- respected, and a, a a prince by the name of Zhu Di takes him under his wing. And so Zhu Di uh, takes Cheng Ho and says, I know you're castrated. I know you have skills. I would like to educate you. And he educates him in all of the Chinese best navigation. And he becomes such a master of it that once uh, a new emperor is named, it's Zhu Di. Zhu Di becomes the emperor of China, and he goes to his friend and he says, you know, I think that China should be able to create a trading navy, uh, a, a way for us to reach out to the world and trade our products and create relationships. And so Chang Ho thinks about the best type of boat that he can create, and he creates this boat on the left. And it's called a treasure ship. Uh, It has nine masts, up to 13 sails. It carries 700 men, uh, and it is able to travel all over Asia as far as Egypt, And over the course of the next couple decades, he creates a full navy of these ships. And Cheng Ho goes out and does seven different diplomatic missions, creating trading relationships between China and the rest of the world. Uh, He is incredibly successful. But when Zhu Di dies... The next emperor says, you know, I don't think that China should be outward facing. 
I think that China should be inward facing. And we don't want all of these huge ships out traveling the world sharing our secrets of China. We're okay with people coming on the Silk Road uh, and trading with us, but we don't want to be extroverts. We want to be introverts. And he outlaws all navigation by China. And this is that point, or this is one of those points in, anyway, where we begin to see China moving into this inward focus that I would argue even lasts until today. Uh, but if we look at these treasure ships, it's hard to see scale when you look at it. But if you think about the caravel, and the caravels coming out a few decades later, the caravel from a Western perspective is a marvel of navigation. That instead of having a side rudder, now we're putting the rudder on the back of the boat. That, that reduces drag and makes the ship more flexible. Instead of having that Viking over, overlapping board, uh, which, is, which is better for not sinking, but it's not great when it comes to resistance. You've got a lot of drag off of that. Now the Caravel has boards on top of each other. Caravel can do something like 100 tons of cargo. It feels great. A Caravel actually would fit in this room. So if you think about a Caravel, this new modern marvel of the Western world, it'll fit in the room. If you were to take the tre treasure ship, it's similar to the size of our boat. So it's 10 times the size of a caravel. So what the, what the East is able to do, what China is able to do with navigation and with a simple compass and dead reckoning is staggering compared to what the West is doing. So uh, it's just China has, has a tremendous amount to offer us, and, and it's sad that we don't spend more time there. Uh, but we also have the Arab world, and we don't talk about the Arab world much. The Arabs, uh, during what we would call the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, were a time of enlightenment for the Arab community. They're studying medicine. They're studying math. They're doing all kinds of things, and one of them is navigation. And that latitude thing, that, that, that north-south, the Arabs come up with a simple way to determine where you are relative to the equator. So it, with, what they do is, is they say, all right, the north star should be directly overhead at the North Pole. And the North Star should be on the horizon at the equator. So they take this little wooden block, they run string through it, you put the string in your mouth, you put the bottom of the block on the horizon, and you put the top of the block on the North Star. And you move your hand back and forth with the string in your mouth. And when you get to the point that the North Star is on top, the horizon is on the bottom, you mark it on your string and you tie a knot. Now, every night that you check that, if you're at the knot, you know you're at the same latitude. And you can run east and west, and you know you're staying on the same latitude. So if you know the latitude of the port you're trying to get to, then you just go west until you hit your port. Uh, and so it's, it's a huge step forward that the Arabs are able to create. And this is called a Kamal. Uh, and then a Greek invention from much earlier um, was the astrolabe. And the astrolabe in general gives us the same idea. It tells us what our latitude is. But if you look at the early Greek version, it is, it is flat and very, very difficult on a tossing sea to be able to determine your position. And so they come up with the mariner's astrolabe that looks like this. Instrument it was also used by the Spanish and Portuguese during the age of exploration. It was made of brass, heavily weighted so as to give it stability on the deck of a pitching ship. The terrestrial version was a flat plate the mariner's version was pierced with holes to allow the wind to pass through so as not to affect its reading. Now let me take a sight. I turn towards the sun, allow the sun's rays to pass through the upper hole, line them up on the lower hole, 
and then read off the scale. Now that seemed easy, but imagine yourself on the deck of a pitching ship. Sometimes the astrolabe was used by three mariners, one to hold it, one to turn the movable arm or alidade, and another to read off the scale. Which is really ingenious. It's this idea that while we're at sea, whether it is nighttime using the Kamal, whether it is daytime using the astrolabe, we can now begin to determine whether we're north or south of the equator and by how much. Now, that's great, but it doesn't tell us everything we need to know. It is a step in nav navigation. Now, go, going back, we have the Vikings, and the Vikings were also using the sun to try to determine their um, position. They have this Icelandic spar, which was believed in a cloudy day to be able to hold up to the clouds and be able to pierce the clouds and see where the sun is. Uh, that's highly debated whether it actually works or not, um, but they also had these sundials that, that may have helped them determine their latitude as well. Uh, one of the things that seems to be true is the Vikings were so skilled at just dead reckoning uh, that they were able to smell dirt that they had worked to hone the way they could smell so much so that as they were approaching land, they could actually determine that, that, that soily smell. Uh, in addition, it is said that some Vikings could taste salinity levels. So as salinity, the saltiness of the sea would change, they could actually tell and by that determine their position. So Vikings used dead reckoning. They did use sun. They did use stars. Uh, and they had some rudimentary um, items as well. So if we kind of go to the age of exploration, this guy is huge. His name is Henry the Navigator. He is a prince uh, and as the uh, Renaissance is really taking hold, he uses the Renaissance and this idea of the rebirth of knowledge uh, to create competitions. And he says, I, you know, I want different people to compete to come up with the best ship design, the best sail design, the best way to navigate. And he gives the state's money to uh, entrepreneurs who come up with new ways to explore. And he's really successful at it. Uh, he is able to, here we show Magellan ship, uh, but he, he, he works because of the fall of Constantinople. That Constantinople, I'd mentioned this in an earlier lecture, that all of China's trade is coming across that Silk Road into either Alexandria and then is being shipped across the Mediterranean or by land up to Constantinople and into Europe. But as the Muslims uh, in Islam moves, first they take over Alexandria and shut that down as a Western access point. And ultimately, in the 15th century, they sack and take over Constantinople. So as the Renaissance is coming up, we also see Islam um, spreading and shutting down access to the Far East. So Europe, especially Spain and Portugal, uh, are trying to find a new route to China for the Silk Road. And to do it, they're trying to find new ways for navigation. And that's what's spurring Henry the Navigator on. He creates the caravel this new modern marvel that is able to now get all the way across the Atlantic, so much so that Spain and Portugal begin to argue over who owns what. Vasco da Gama uh, for Portugal comes down Africa, around the bottom of Africa, and makes his way into the Far East. Spain, with Columbus, go west and hit the Americas. Uh, they go to the Pope, and they say to the Pope, we've got to divide this up. We're both saying all of the world is ours, and the Pope comes up with something you may have heard of called the Tortoisillus Line. And the Tortoisillus line is an arbitrary line that the Pope drew and said everything west of this line goes to Spain. Everything east of this line goes to Portugal. 
And the line goes what through what South American country? Brazil, which is why Brazil speaks Portuguese and the rest of South America speaks Spanish. So it's the Pope's, the Pope's decision to split the world in half. Uh, and all because Henry the Navigator is out there and instead of saying everything belongs to the crown, he comes up and says, I am going to equip you, but I only want 20% of the profits which means that now everyone has an incentive to go out and explore and navigate and make new ways uh, to move into these new colonial areas and trading posts. He also is credited, he and his sailors, with finding the trade winds. So he finds that, in fact, if you go south and west, you're able to pick up winds that will take you to the Americas. And then if you travel up the coast and pick up winds in the north, they will bring you back to Europe. Uh, Columbus is able to use many of these items we've talked about. Columbus actually keeps incredible notes, and I love this about him. As he was able to go and find the Caribbean, Columbus keeps notes on how many days what his speed was, uh, where he was navigating, and then he creates a second logbook that is a total lie. And he gives the crown the wrong logbook. And he does that so no one can follow him. Only he knows how he got there. But at that point, speed was a problem. You could tell you had been sailing for 14 days, but you, and you might even know which latitude you were on but you didn't know how far you had gone. And so Columbus comes up with this idea of tying a rope around a log, throwing the log off the side of the ship, having a hourglass that gives you 30 seconds, tying a knot every so many feet, and then counting how many knots went through your hand in 30 seconds. And that becomes known as knots. And so he is credited with giving us a very simplistic way of determining speed. We also, it's important to know how deep it is. I had a boat that I reefed once, so it's really important. And I even had my GPS finder going beep, 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 and I still hit this thing. Uh, so hitting things is bad. Uh, and so knowing how deep you are, they, they begin to come up with these lead um, finders that give you a sounding of how far far down you are, and they measured in fathoms, and a fathom is six feet. So if you were five fathoms, you were 30 feet to the, to the, to the ground. Uh, and then they even begin here in the early 1800s, because if you drop it off the boat and the boat is moving, it's really difficult to determine how deep when the lead hits the ground. So they create this thing that has little dials and fins, so as it drops, it spins through the water and turns the dials and actually tells you how deep it was as it fell. So we're seeing navigational changes, uh, not just in a rudimentary rope, but now we're beginning to see gears and dials. Uh, charts, incredibly important. The Portuguese were some of the very first, uh, especially on animal skin, to make charts. There are stories of spies and espionage to try to steal someone else's charts because it becomes very important, especially in the Spice Islands, uh, to fig figure out where all of these islands are and what they have to offer. And the Portuguese did that. Uh, we, we look at Polaris, the North Star, uh, and for, for, for most of us, you know this, uh, the North Star is sitting generally over the North Pole. When the Earth moves, all the stars move during the course of the night, except the North Star, which in general just sits there above the North. Uh, to find it, it is the handle of Ursa Minor or the Little Dipper. You just take the front edge of the Big Dipper and you go north till you hit the North Star. Now, what some of us don't know is that 5,000 years ago, the North Star was not the North Star. It was just Polaris. Because the Earth's axis is continually shifting, 5,000 years ago, Thuban was the North Star. And 5,000 years from now, uh, Alderaman will be the North Star. 
about 25,000 years from now, Polaris will be back to be the North Star. So the North Star over the course of time actually does shift. But for our purposes in navigation today, it is the only star that stays constant over the night sky. And then to become even more um, correct, they come up with the sextant. Uh, and if you look on the left, you'll actually see how a sextant works. So you press the clamp, you move it forward, and as you're moving that, that gear, the sun will line up. You then push it up and down to make sure you have it right. Once you're sure that they line up, you lock it, you read in the gear, and it tells you your latitude. So over the course of time, starting really with the Greeks, but moving through uh, Islam and the Muslims, the Arabs, um, we find latitude until we get to the sextant, and now we have it very closely. But they, they did these things called running an easterly or running a westerly, and that's once you have your latitude and you know your port's latitude, all you have to do is go east or west and you run into your port. Well, a British fleet actually thought they were on one latitude when they were not. And we have the lar one of the largest naval disasters in all of Great Britain, where almost 2,000 sailors who were running down a easterly, uh, or a westerly at that point, um, crash into a bunch of rocks. So they thought they were on one latitude, and they were not. And so England sits down and says, we need to understand longitude better. And they create a, a board to determine longitude. And they actually give a prize that in today's dollars is millions of dollars. The first guy who can actually determine where we are east-west uh, is going to get paid. And, and when we look at longitude, one of the first ideas was, well, if we measure the angle between the moon and a star, uh, and we look at the lunar distance between the two and the horizon, and we do a number of calculations, then in about 14 days, we'll figure out where we were 14 days ago. Uh, so, so while this mathematically works, it's very difficult to do at sea. But then they begin to come up with what is a brilliant and yet simple understanding. How many degrees are there in a globe? 360 degrees. How many hours are there in a day? 24. You divide the two, and you find out that if you were to break the globe of 360 degrees, and you were to say you went around it in one day, like the sun does, then every 15 degrees of the east-west longitude is one hour. Brilliant. Simple. I mean, that is a great thing. So if you know that I am traveling 15 degrees west of London and it's noon in London, what time is it where I am? I can give you an easier question. No, it's 11 o'clock because we've gone one hour west. So just go the opposite. If you know it's noon over in uh, London and you know your current time is two hours, how many degrees west of London are you? 30 degrees. Simple. We now know where we are. That's great. Except uh, we don't know how to tell time. Uh, details. I mean, I, 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 am, I am a big picture guy. So uh, it's this, now we have to determine what time is it where we are and what time is it where we were. And if we know those two numbers, we can determine how far east or west we are. So all we have to do first, what time is it where we are? Well, they have calculations at sea to be able to, to determine what time it is. But they didn't have clocks to determine what time is it in London and how far have we gone. And so it's this idea that now to solve the problem, it's not that we have to create a device to tell us 
our longitude, we have to be, create a device to tell us what time it is. Uh, and that's what happens in 1759 with Harrison's H4, the Sea Watch, is now you're able to actually tell the time accurately in the place we left because clocks are sophisticated enough to keep time over several days. Uh, Captain Cook come, comes along and he adds navigation that we're actually looking at maps. Uh, he also is the guy that he, he brings uh, zoologists and botanists and cartographers. He brings all kinds of different people with him uh, as he sails. So he's not just sailing for wealth, he is sailing for knowledge. He brings artists. Uh, he brings. Uh, he goes out and he brings back potatoes. He goes out and he brings back other items. So he is trying to improve the way we understand, not just capture territory. We then begin to look at line of position. How can we determine our spot as we travel, not just on an easterly or a westerly, not just latitude or longitude, but on the diagonal how can we determine our position? Ultimately, we then come to where the Americas begin to take uh, a hand in this. And time is relative. If you go back to the 1800s, and you were in New York, and you were in Baltimore, there might be two different times being kept. That because there, there, was, there was no standardized time. And the railroads, especially as the railroads went west, had a major issue trying to determine what time because every town had a different time. Uh, and ultimately, the American railroads get together and say, we have to standardize this. And they take that 15-degree inst instrument and say, well, the United States should have four time zones, and we're going to create a railroad standard time. And they create create this time for the railroad, and then all the cities adopt it. Ultimately, over the next couple, couple of years, it becomes so well thought of that they create Greenwich Mean Time, the prime meridian running through London, and then the entire world adopts this time. Uh, if we look then, it moves into compasses. We come into different types of compasses. Now we have the gyroscopic com compass so that as you're speeding up or slowing down or turning left or turning right, uh, you have a gyro spinning that keeps your compass accurate. Uh, we also move in World War II to radar. Uh, radar is kind of a joint invention between America and Britain, uh, each con uh, containing pieces of it. But it is clear that radar played a major role in World War II in the protection of England and Great Britain from the Nazis as they were able to determine not only air power but sea power and sea items. They, they create this thing called the Chain Home Project, which is a group of radar uh, that allowed you to triangulate position and speed during World War II. Radar, the term, actually does come from the Americans. Uh, and then during World War II, they also create Loran. Loran was a lower frequency idea that could be used for ranging and for navigation. When I first became a pilot, Loran was still very, very active. Uh, you had Loran A, B, and C, did, did different versions of it that started by saying, well, we know within about 10 miles where you are to we know within about 10 feet where you are. Uh, so these Loran stations, which were used predominantly by the Americans, especially in the Pacific for navigation, uh, uh, naval sea nav navigation during World War II. And then ultimately, we move into GPS that we now all have on our phone today, where if you have four different satellites, then you can get a general fix, four or more, five, you can now begin to get a great fix. And it's this GPS system, not only for ships like ours, when we are in navigation where there's fog like we have seen, we can find exactly where, where we are. But also as a pilot, uh, it allows us to virtually land in zero or near zero visibility. So as we look at GPS, navigation has come a very long way that you're even able to open your phone and know exactly where you are. So moving from 
stars, smelling dirt, and sea to the GPS. So we have Polynesians who have stars and birds. Birds, me Mediterranean navigators were using landmarks. Chinese, magnetic compass. Arabs, the Kamal and the astrolabe. Viking, sun compass and sunstones. British, sextants, sextants, sea clocks charts and the Americans Loran and GPS. So we've covered several thousand years in about 48 minutes. Uh, have a great sea day and thanks for coming.